We'll talk with the knowledge keeper as a whole. Oh, the person has more experience than anybody else. Okay. Um, so feel free to ask any questions later on, keep notes, whatever you want, just feel free. We're here to discuss, not to have a formal thing. Okay? That's it. Um, let's start. I'm going to do a quick one minute presentation. So I'm not sure if it's uh, how eligible people are. But um, this place here, that we run a program called London Creative and Digital Fusion. You might have seen all this stuff around the table. And effectively, what we do is we help um, any creative and digital companies in London. So we're funded by Europe to just help them grow. So whatever their business goals are, we try and help them to get there. If they want to make more money, if they want to employ more people, if you want to get premises, if you want to just grow your infrastructure, then we encourage people to do this. And the reason I, I linked up with Tommy on this event was because um, my background is in the music industry, so what I'm aware of is there are a lot of people in the industry who don't think of themselves as businesses, where if they slightly change their status, I'll give an example. A band is providing business-to-business -business services. They don't realise that, they think they're just going around and gigging in different venues. But they're not, they're providing a music service. So it's what today is about, the overriding theme is thinking of ourselves as more than just artists and as businesses and keeping that balance right between artistic talent and business. So London Fusion, as I said, what we try and do is give that help where it's needed. We work with six different universities so we can help you if you need if you need expertise from a specific university, we can get you that too. Um, our partners are um, UBC on the bottom, so we've got the Royal College of Arts, we've got um, London University, Queen Mary <coughs> University, all big institutions who want to work with smaller businesses, smaller companies, and up and coming startups. So we're trying to facilitate that process. So I'm not going to spend too long on this. Suffice to say, if you think you're interested, we have plenty of master classes going on, we have things around business modeling, things around digital marketing, social media, all kinds of subjects as well we're teaching about. So if you do want to know more, speak to me at the end of the evening and I can help you. If you're not in the situation to actually engage with us, I can help you get to that situation, or if you are, help you move forward in that way. And I will leave it at that and pass on to incredibly academic and I think it's quite possible that a talk called authentic, authenticity versus success could be a 
three-hour lecture looking at, you know, everything from early pop music sociology through to, you know, the latest papers on, um, I don't know, Web2 um, ideas of success. Um, it would be an interesting talk to give. I'm not entirely sure I'd be the right person. Um, but I am very, very inspired and influenced by a lot of the people that might give that kind of talk. Um, a bit of context to me. Uh, it'll come up again anyway, because I've kind of included a little bit of an autobiography in what I'm going to talk about. Um, but uh, I am, what should I say first? It's always interesting when you put it inside someone's head first. But I am a musician first. And I've been playing music for about 20 odd years, uh, and still very active today. Um, you can probably see if you're studying what looks like I haven't washed for a week, I have, but I'm also a painter, and covered in paint, I can't get it off. Um, that's also going to be quite important. That's not just a little sort of random aside. The fact that I'm a musician and a painter kind of informs the way I may work, but it also informs a lot of the things that I teach in the college I teach in. And just to tell you about that, I'm also a lecturer and a course manager at the British Academy of New Music. And I think the proudest thing that I've been involved in there is a thing called the Arts Development Programme, which is kind of uniquely modelled on a sort of late 60s, mid 70s art school. Um, if that doesn't mean anything to anyone, um, I don't know if it does, but usually, well, anyone who's been to art school knows what that means. Art schools were eventually kind of shut down how they were in the 60s and 70s because it was considered too progressive uh, tutors and lecturers weren't teaching facts and uh, students were left to kind of explore their own ideas in their own time um, to be visited by lecturers occasionally who would kind of tap them on the shoulder. There's a wry smile from the gentleman there, I don't think he may have been to ask them. But uh, <laughs> someone might tap you on the shoulder once every sort of six weeks and say, you know, yeah, I like that. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. You, you kind of wonder about what that meant. But, Anyone who does go to art school, well, most people who go to art school, come out thinking that was quite a wild experience and they kind of remember it forever. And I think one thing they do remember is that those little conversational things that happen go on having currency or go on having value in your mind for your whole life. So something does happen, but it lasts. And I think that's the difference, perhaps, between the facts that aren't facts, that are presented as facts, but are actually just opinions, they go out of date. And I think a lot of things in music, um, if you watch someone desperately trying to teach facts, um, it does go out of date. So every generation of musicians going through music college has a different set of so-called truths and facts, and therein lies the problem. So that's enough about that. Um, <clears throat> so what is my idea? Well, I love that little drawing. It's got fun. Um, I like how you read your own. My idea is fairly simple, and I'm only going to probably talk for about 35 minutes, although those that know me no, I probably might get carried away and talk for longer. But 40 minutes, I think, max. Um, my idea is, now let me try and say it in a simple way, otherwise I'll stutter on for hours trying to get it right. Um, I'm very, very interested in how, let's call it artists for now, because that's a bigger catch-all, but I know we're probably talking about musicians. So I'll talk about musicians. It's musicians. We're artists. Musicians. Our strategies, my, my sort of central thesis, if you like, is that strategies that musicians use are or reflect values, attitudes, and beliefs that are way wider than we can ever really know. Now, that's quite an obvious thing to say. What am I saying? That our decisions in terms of what we do as artists are driven by our attitudes to life. It's a very broad philosophical statement, and it's not um, particularly useful at that stage. Um, but if I was to go on to say that those values, attitudes and beliefs are not strictly speaking simply the products of your own life experience. Okay, now I'm not going to go overly philosophical with this, but my idea is that depending on what genre we work in, okay, so I'll come to that in a second, but you know what I mean by genre. So start thinking about all the various genres you can think of. Imagine it across the board. I'll put a slide up in a minute with them all up. But my idea is, and after studying how musicians work for the last 11 years, I've noticed that when I know the genre that someone is working in, without having a particularly long conversation with them, I can guess, if you like, it's an informed judgment. I can kind of work out what they've probably been doing to sell their work. I can probably guess 
how they actually produce their music, and it goes all the way through. That's just a, it's not a magic trick, but it feels like that to a lot of students that I work with, because they often say later, they say, how did you know that that was the problem? Well, because I've made a connection in my own mind between something that happens within genres, values, attitudes, and beliefs, and ideas, are stable enough over the last 50 years to be able to make an informed guess as to how they might be going about their work. Does that penny drop a little bit? So that's my basic idea. So through a series of sort of different kinds of approaches, I want to look at that. And I think that the practical outcome of all of this, because there needs to be one, um, is to reflect, I suppose, on your own genre. Think about how you, uh, how you sort of develop ideas and think about how those ideas might be similar to other people that work in the genre. And then I suppose it's a series of counterintuitive thoughts, such as what would happen if you didn't do that? <laughs> what would happen if you did that instead? Now, the other axis I mentioned uh, that I'm very interested in is art, <coughs> painting. I'm an obsessive painter. Um, and that running through me, for, for quite a few years, I thought this is nothing to do with music, and I never used to talk to musicians about it. And then I realised that something very, very interesting goes on in visual art. I'll just say one thing about it now and move on. But I noticed that you could get old as a painter, a bit like poets. They were able to age disgracefully. And it didn't matter. In fact, if you found out that your favourite poet was 86, all the better. And then you think, well, when, I saw, when you sign a record contract, you're called an artist, but you're not really, not, how are you, why are you so different? Why, as a popular music artist, is that ceiling on your career 25? Now, I don't know what date you set in your head, but allow me one short digression. I've also noticed that there's a gender difference with this. Girls get very panicky around 25. Come and tell me that we can't go on any longer. They're way too old. And you sort of look at them thinking, oh, how old are you? You know, they say 25. And you know, I'm 23. It's really going through a nightmare on this. God. And I think to myself, what would happen if you were a poet? Would you have the same thing? So something cognitively is actually causing distress. So popular music is an egg timer with very little sand in it. And uh, men and women vary. Uh, or there's, there's differences are drawn along gender lines. So um, does that make any sense at this point? OK, hopefully I'll uh, unpack it. So that's my basic idea. So it's the first of a few sort of creative slides. Don't worry about it. Well, the academic ideas behind this, um, they, are, they do come out of research done by good old Simon Frick, who is the, I think he's the chairman of the Mercury Music Prize, but he's also one of our leading academics um, in popular music. And uh, he puts forward the idea that popular music is a series of codifications, that popular music isn't, uh, origi originality is not the right thing to talk about when we're talking about popular music. But really what it is is a series of trends and ideas that are shared, and it's that code that enables non-trained people, audiences and fans, to be able to get it instantly. And if it wasn't like that, you would have to be a musician to get it. Now there is a lot of music where you do have to be a musician to get it. Um, contemporary classical music is usually liked by people who've studied contemporary classical music or play it themselves. Jazz is also similar. But popular music and the art of popular music is communicating to the great uninitiated. So something has to be shared. Now the idea is, coming from the sort of academy of popular music, <coughs> is that there are <coughs> cultural sort of codes and ideas that people can instantly spot. So they can look at the image of someone in a photograph, know immediately that that's an R&B musician before they've even heard it, and they can look at someone standing like this, and instantly make the assumption that this means rock, or possibly slightly looser indie, possibly. But we'd like to have our legs together for indie, don't we? So, rock, indie, rock, indie. And it's amazing how simple moving of the legs can change the whole syntax, the whole expectation. So, a marketing strategy could literally, don't take it the wrong way, be a case of opening your legs or closing them, the way I'm doing it here. So don't misunderstand me when I say that. Um, but this is interesting, and it's interested a lot of social theorists because, in some senses, it belittles popular music. It undermines the credentials of a serious art form if it's simply a series of signs and symbols. 
Um, how can this be a serious art if that's what it's about? But I don't view it like that. And one of the things that I find fascinating about popular music is precisely that, the way that we communicate very, very quickly with signs and symbols. However, I do have a critical view on anything that limits the artist. So when I've been working with artists in, de in, in, in a development context, that has to be challenged, that notion of expectation, especially when it comes down to creative processes. So, look, you're doing it this way, and you're marketing it this way, but it's not working. Have you noticed that the way that you're making music and the way that you're marketing it is exactly the same as everyone else in your genre? Have you ever thought about changing that? Or have you ever thought about being influenced by a non-music artist and then looking at their process and thinking, how might that, how might that work in the context of what I'm doing? Um, I so want to leap the gun here and sort of say all sorts of other things because I think I'll, I'll treat myself to one luxurious future sort of thought is that this is precisely what is happening. The way the music industry is changing is that people are now doing anything they like. And some of the most successful projects are actually made of some of my bon bonkers ideas. I think um, Atoms for Peace, you know, Tom York's ideas, is kind of quite out of the box. And I think that thing that was on Lauren Laverne the other day called Melt Yourself Down, but if I hear that, it comes out that acoustic lady lounge, polar bear, sort of Deptford Creek jazz experimental music, vortex, and so whatever. There they were doing an in session during the day on Lauren Laverne's show. Well, that's totally bonkers. And if you tried to work out what was most likely to get on Daytime Radio 6 music, you wouldn't have written that down. So the creatives are winning. So somewhere in all of this, people who are hybridising and challenging their work in different ways, uh, and coming up with unusual ways of marketing it, are starting to win. Okay, that still might be fairly obvious. So here it is just put into a long and fairly poorly um, structured sentence, but I thought I'd write it down just in case everyone was absolutely lost by this point. Um, Beliefs, oh sorry, genres are encoded or infused with different beliefs about authenticity, and we use these beliefs to structure our development strategies as artists to achieve success. That's quite bad explainers, but it's quite good to return to the title of the lecture. Um, I'm very interested in you all achieving success, that's great, and I'm very interested in this notion of authenticity, but the notion of authenticity shifts and changes in relation to the genre that you partake in. Now my guess is, no, I'm giving it away. No, no I won't guess it's anything at the moment. Um, I'll pull rabbit out the hat at the appropriate time. Well, I'll pull the rabbit in the hat to pull out, might be a good idea. Um, so when we look at uh, a page of like this, if we had more time to pursue it, and we could like delve in even more deeply into some of these things, if I asked you for to pick one genre of that page that you thought completely encapsulated the notion of authenticity, I've got a hunch that I know which one you'd pick. But we can't test this very well without you writing it down and me saying it and then you revealing it. But when I've done this before, it turns out that this one has it. <coughs> Would anyone have agreed? Yeah. yeah. And if I come over... Where could I go? Please be on there. Um, you know what? It isn't. It's a silly slide. But imagine I wrote another one. If I put pop here. Pop's not there. Pop's not there. <laughs> Where? Top right. Top right. Top right. Yeah. 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 It's not saying the wood for the trees, isn't it? It's too big. It should be smaller. I've looked at this one. Pop might come really quite low on the scale. And we can have a long debate about why that is. And I know as a musician myself that rock musicians take enormous amounts of pride on the authenticity of their work. And uh, you get really interesting think that's my cup, you get really interesting statements such as paying your dues. You know, if, if success doesn't come, it doesn't matter, I'm paying my dues. I'm still there at 38, paying your dues. You know, it's like what are you doing these days, still paying those dues. And yet there's a healthy amount of anger built up, which is kind of I hate everyone else. Especially pop musicians. I get all the money and I'm paying my due. And they say, what is the obviously? If you just decided in your mind that your birthright is authenticity just because of some cultural chance that you decided to be, get into rock music. Hip hop doesn't get off very lightly either. Because hip hop is also riddled with notions of keeping it real. I think that's a similar similar idea to the rock kind of concept. No, I'm not anti any of these genres. I'm just taking a kind of forensic look at the way 
particular genres take ownership over particular ideas about authenticity. Does that make sense? And the poor old pop musician is left feeling kind of vulnerable and kind of the last thing they can claim is authenticity and if they don't make it well, they're just a disaster and they better just go off and wait for a television program to be made called Here's a lot of disasters from 10 years ago, look at them now, they're a bit older. <laughs> <laughs> Which there was a program like that recently, actually. Really? Um, <laughs> uh, so, is it a crazy idea? Well, you can probably guess from my slightly frothing, sort of, uh, well, it might be, based on the frothing. Um, but I don't think it is a crazy idea. And now, let's see if I can, uh, the job of any lecturers to try and prove it. Now, what I wanted to do was to have on everyone's table a handout bit school, I've got so it probably best I didn't do it. But let's sort of do this um, in our heads. But <clears throat> I've done this experiment quite a few times before. Um, if we work through this along the lines that one is an inauthentic type and five is an extremely authentic, um, have a think about it just for a couple of seconds. I'll take a sip of water and think about where your um I can't go through that way, I'm sort of <coughs> my knees that way, too long this way. But um, you might get, you can put your totals down here, add them up. You can do various kind of graphs and play around with this. No, we can't do it because you don't. But um, have a think about where you might put things. Um, should have put folk up there, it wasn't enough. But folk should have been up there, really. I mean, you, there's loads of things that should have been up there. There's just a few of the most obvious ones. So. Okay. That's how it tends to go. Does anyone see a similar graph? <laughs> Now, it, it fits with, um, there's a lot of research that has been done around these areas, and most people tend to think like that, and uh, one starts to wonder what the rock strategists look, what rock strategies look like in relation to pop strategies, based on the fact that musicians, when asked, tend to have these kinds of views. And it seems to fall along whether it's serious music or not. I mean, interestingly, and it's another kind of lecture in a way, Pop music probably has the most amount of strategy put into it, and yet not many people use the strategies the pop industry use because they reject it based on its inauthenticity. So people bury themselves in things they feel more able to discuss socially, the big authentic things, so you get the big hip hop thing, you get the big rock thing, you get the big indie thing, and they're constantly shouting about how, you know, uh, or, well, or how authentic it is. But then you could open the doors to another question, which I just kind of popped up in my mind, really, but in another time we could have talked about another thing here. But how does it divide down, down to gender lines? The starters is an interesting question. I mean, it looks rather dominated. It looks like the boys have the cards on the authenticity thing, which is also interesting. Um, because if they also have the, uh, the ticket for the long career, they're going to have more options to achieve what they're trying to do. And uh, the people that can't hang on to those credentials are going to have very little sand in their egg timers. <coughs> Therefore, you know, your strategy for takeoff has to be based on how long the runway is. So in education, I found it very interesting to see how girls try to assemble strategies and how boys assemble strategies. And I can tell from listening to both two types of students talk, or both students talking, that one is under a lot more pressure than the other, and the other has given themselves a lot more license to try more things out. Not always. And I think what's interesting is when you get, um, and this isn't really supposed to be a, a gender discussion, but I think it's an important thing to put in, um, that when you actually start, uh, you sort of notice women that do make it in this industry, especially in this country, um, they have hybridized their strategic methods. Their methodologies are not strictly stereotypically female. They're not thinking in the pop box. It's not they're not making pop, it's just they're making pop, but maybe using a rock method. Do you see what I'm saying? And usually it's got a lot to do with being kind of tooled up and skilled up to be able to work independently. Because the thing about pop is that as soon as you become a pop act, you invite teams of people into the studio to kind of work with you, writers and God knows what else. So I find that very interesting, um, a very interesting thing in itself. But people following me so far, yeah? Good. Thank you for bearing with me uh, with this. I mean, I, uh, this is probably something that after our discussion we can break down, you know, we, we can talk again, I mean, we can talk on Facebook, talk quite fine, that's how I got to know Tommy, wherever he's gone, over there. Um, always happy, and I think a lot of these ideas need to be chewed on and kind of argued with and, and to, to try and assimilate them into some sort of personal 
strategy. I, my talks are always more on the sort of inspirational side, not like declaring myself inspirational, but they're more that way than they are simply facts to apply to your work. But they do, they can result in lots of good um, sort of further discussions. Um, okay, so it also looks a bit like this, genre or this bit, uh, the ratings. Um, this is just dragged out of a study by Frit. Um, once again, rock takes up 35% of this, uh, well, you can see what it's saying there, and poor old pop comes out in 7%. Pop music drives the economy in the music industry, and look at our attitudes towards it. <laughs> it makes it almost, almost amazing. You know, when someone comes on my course and declares themselves a pop act, now, interestingly, I wasn't going to call people out of the room, but there are two of my current students over there. Sorry if that embarrasses you, but it's great to have you here. They are a self-declared, they're both pop musicians. And what's great and refreshing about both of those guys over there is that they uh, declared that with confidence, and they set about working in a very 1970s art school environment as pop musicians, but learning loads from how other people have done things and things like that. But it's always very interesting, because it's actually they're actually bucking the trend. And I know they're aware of it too, which is also very exciting, but they buck trends. They're kind of going to be pop stars, but they're going to be pop stars their way. And if the rock musician thinks that they've got all of the clever stuff over here, they've probably nicked it out of your bag already because they're thinking ahead of that, you know. They're ahead of that kind of unity way of thinking. Um, <clears throat> okay, now I just want to indulge a little bit, make sure I'm on the right side. My own career, now, what we've got here is a classic graph um, type of scenario. We've got uh, a metric going down the left hand, your left, yes, right hand side. Um, success and failure, very, very basic. You've got dates going from 1991 to 2013, and this maps my own career as a musician. Um, and it's a very, very straightforward thing at first. The second slide gives it a bit more, uh, makes it a bit more interesting. But basically, I came to London in 91 and I signed a deal with Acid Jack. So, um, at the time, a very interesting time, because lots of groove musicians, I'm a bass player, started to get work. Acid jazz made jazz acceptable. It wasn't just jazz anymore. That word acid fitted into that whole thing about acid house. And a lot of people bought into it because that word was there. They later couldn't work out why it was there, but it was a trick. But it kind of, it was just so people could play Royer's tracks, but somehow people would be thinking about breaking at the same time, and somehow that would work. Um, but it's too late now, like, we're the um, So there was a little blip in my life. Um, before that, I'd been at art school, and no, I don't know, I was in the northeast making music. But anyway, then there was a drop, because, like, inevitably that fell away, fell away about 94. And then I signed to a label with a guy called Trevor Jackson, um, to a label called Output, um, with a band called Graham, who I'm still with, and um, check out our music, you might like. <laughs> Um, still very active, and the peak went up. That, that peak is slightly higher than that peak. So you can see that from my point of view, my success was increasing after a dip, okay? Output, we left output, and there was a drop. In 95, we had nowhere to go, and uh, we dropped right down. Probably the first major plummet um, into the valley below here. Strove on, um, and got signed by um, a label called Junior Boys Own through Richard Branson's label, V2, which was a self-declared major label because he got loads of money from, I don't know where he got the money from, the HSBC Bank, I think, and just decided that, because he put so much money into it, it was a major label. Um, and it was a great time for us. We were signed to a major label, loads of loads of press. Everyone said the band made it. This is success, They've been successful. And it was great. The perception from all my friends and other people around where we were touring, were that we, we were becoming successful. Um, <coughs> that ended in, in about, uh, my date's right there. Um, well, it's not quite right. It ended around 2001. It should be a little bit there. Okay, right there. Massive crash down. If anyone's come out of a major label situation, been dropped, album shelved, that's a long fall. It's like, whoa, you keep falling for several weeks until you hit the ground. And then there was the doldrums, which lasted right up until 2008. I didn't really do very much music at all, and that was the period when I started got into education during that gap. And then last year, we signed to Tommy Touch in New York, and um, we we're experiencing a whole load of success again. And it's going up, and I haven't limited it, it just goes on. Hopefully, it will keep going on, whatever. But 
that's quite a long period of time that I've been making music. This graph shows how success and authenticity connect in my own brain. Now, for the first part of my career, it all felt authentic. I was following the graph. Yes, I see jazz growth feeling output. Oh, yes. But look at that great big peak. Look at how the thing I thought I was striving for, actually looking back at the benefit of hindsight, I come crashing all the way down. And actually looking back to now, it was an absolute mistake. And yet everything that we've been trying to do had been aimed at that, uh, that particular successful outcome. So what this, I think, tells us, or hopefully illustrates a bit, is the way that, uh, I suppose in simple kind of like a moral lesson, is that the things that we strive for, put all our energy to, could be utterly wrong. So we spend a lot of time developing strategies um, that can be utterly wrong for the kind of music that we're making. Now, this is where it comes quite complex. I never really knew what kind of music I was making. So in this period of my life here, where I started to develop the kind of ideas I'm talking about now, I could also see that I wasn't really a genre musician. But I think another thing that maybe I'm offering up is that a lot of my attitudes and ideas about development don't come from somebody who has been completely signed up to a particular way of, just, uh, particular way of marketing music. But that's because I, came, I suppose I didn't have a genre that I felt at home in. So therefore I never had a rock approach or a funk approach or a disco approach or anything really. I just kind of went along with what was going on until the calamity happened. But the calamity happened, I think, partly because I wasn't really building strategies. I was just being a musician and following my nose. Um, but as I've learned about the sort of music I want to make, and I've been able to develop strategies on companies, and I'm slightly more clearer diagram in a second, I believe that this rise back late in life, I mean, I'm quite old now, um, this sort of late rise, this curve, has been a combination of two things. I've worked out what I am, I suppose, what is authentic to me, what works for me, what my beliefs and values are, I've finally sort of nailed it. I think partly through teaching or working with other people has helped me work that myself. And then the strategies that started to be put together two or three years ago for the band suddenly enabled us to achieve success. And now I feel, for the first time in my life, there is some synergy between um, the the music that I'm making and the success that I'm getting. But when I achieved success earlier in life, the success was very hollow because it wasn't actually in sync with who I am. So the moral lesson probably is be careful what you call success and think carefully about how you define authenticity in music. But these are quite conceptual things to think through. But the starting point is to think whether you share any of the things I was suggesting in the previous slide. And to ask yourself whether your methods might actually be fairly stereotypical within the genres that they're set in. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. And look around at artists that start to get on the Lauren Burns show. And I don't just mean Lauren, I'm not here to promote Lauren. But look at other artists breaking through in the UK. Have a look at the interesting things going on. And ask yourself, have they managed to find a way out of the expectations of what people thought people should do in that genre? Are they doing things differently? How are they doing those things differently? And you'll find it's their beliefs and their attitudes that are changing the way in which they're perceived in the music industry. Um, yeah, okay, I, I, I one quick, uh, quick, not digression, it's just, just a little example. I've recently got into that band Hain, I might be saying, hi Hain, I think they're amazing. Yeah, when right. I first heard them, my daughter, my 15 year old daughter, was playing it in her house. Ah, that's, that, that is great, that's classic something. And I, I was, it sounded like pop music to me, which is one of my, you know, I love pop music. Going around the house singing it, you know, baby, don't save me. Love that song. Like, what is that? She kept saying it's Hayne. Hayne. I said, that oh, weird name. Hayne, right. Okay. I forget who they were and then a day later. Who is that? Hayne. <laughs> who? Hayne. Baby, don't save me. I was still going to sing it. And in the air, I thought, oh, I've got it. They were on the Jules Holland show. I thought, I've got to watch it. And the, it came on and it was a, uh, it was, did anyone see it? I mean, it was amazing. Now, I can explain why it was so amazing. They didn't look how I thought they would look. It wasn't the band that I thought they were. Everything clicked together. This grungy kind of band. Face pair was brilliant. Making some great faces. It's all faces that blokes make. You think they're allowed to make faces, but girls aren't allowed to make 
fact, people told me after, she's a girl making the best of weird faces. It's like, what is that problem? Why can't girls make faces like that? I don't think I've got it. You know? no, make that face. <coughs> Great. Really edgy, pumping music. Bloke on drums, women up front, guitar, vocals, bass. Pop song. All over Radio 1. That, to me, we haven't got time now, but that to me is a very interesting case study about 2013 in music. They're doing something different, but not just trying to make different kinds of music. It's the way they're mixing and matching expectations of what you expect a melody to link with. So here's a pop track, essentially it could be sung by any pop musician, delivered in a rock and roll way, probably because of that, with rock and roll legs, i.e. I bet they've paid their dues to. I bet they've done that two and a half thousand shows a year across the northwest. You know. And yeah, I don't know how many pop singers would be invited to do that. But I bet they've really grinded it up. Like Which is interesting. So you've got pop growing up a rock tree. Make sense? It's only a proposition, it's conjecture. I've got no evidence of that, but this is my imagination playing with me, and that's why. Um, well, I thought, shoot, you know, you've got some rubbish, please. So, a lot of this is based on the power of hindsight. Um, many artists who I respect came up with, have come up with uh, phenomenal sort of philosophical insights later in life. Picasso on the painting side, Matisse on the painting side. I, I, I love those kind of reading quotes from artists as they get older. So when they look back at their lives, they're able to tell you things that you could learn from. But I, I, it makes me think the way. The music business, when people get older, they just get cynical. And it's because if their dreams haven't come true, they hate everyone that ever becomes successful. They declare pop musicians in sympathy with the devil. They're packing their Jews. And in the end, they end up playing the blues, don't they? Because <laughs> <laughs> they're still going to stick to it, you know. They hate everyone. There's something definitely wrong. Sorry. Um, but one thing that Matisse, you don't know Matisse, is Tom Connell, French painter, but very inspirational quickly say is that Matisse got to a point, I think in his 70s, <coughs> it's just amazing, in his 70s, and uh, people still taking notice. I think some arts have really got this sorted out, that age does actually lead to wisdom, I totally believe it. Um, but basically, you look back at your life, and what you see are things that you've returned to over and over again. The cruelty of life, just before I explain what I'm about to say, is that by the time you crack the perfect relationship between how you see meaning and how you see success, probably keel over. That's the sad thing is you just drop down dead before you do anything about it. That's a bit grim. But basically Matisse talks about if this was your life here, if this was 70 years across this table, if you look back at everything you've done, you'll see things recurring time and time again. Even when you think you're making big changes, some things keep coming back. There's a pattern to your taste, there's a pattern to the way that you do things. And the successful artist I think starts to notice the things that don't fit in to what other people say they should be doing, but they're things they can't stop returning to. The idea is to take the patterns in your past and project them into the present. So once you start to have enough of your life lived to be able to spot patterns, that is your marketing strategy. That is who you are. That is what people need to know about. That's what you need to elevate in your work. You, what happens is if you keep doing it the way everyone else does it, it's never interesting and you miss the trick why you're interesting. But the way people categorise disasters and successes in their lives are so routine, they miss the way failure can become success by, you know, seeing how why it's interesting. And a really good PR company knows that I mean, really great PR companies, say like Toast or something like that, they're really good at helping artists to spot the bits they feel really, really ashamed about and say, no, let's wear, wear this right on our sleeve, let's wear it right here. You know, but it's counterintuitive because most people want to forget the bits that go wrong. But, you know, they can be the moments where you crack outside the stereotype and actually start doing something. I mean, that's once again a bit of a philosophical view, but hey, that's me. That's what you're going to get from me anyway. So, uh, <laughs> um, so here's the kind of diagram that I see. It. It's a creative diagram, therefore it's not based on any particular metric anyone can take to understand. But pop and art are two things that really interest me. The pop part of me, the pop musician part of me, loves this thing. Commercialism, media, image, entertainment, the fact that it's disposable is quite interesting sometimes. 
hits and fame. It's all very interesting. But this other thing over here that it's tempered against or measured against art, that word, you know, just a quick, another quick digression. I've asked students many times over the years, you're an artist. And they go, yeah. How do you know? Because that's what's written on the contract. Artist sign here. Okay, try this exercise. Do you make art? No. Oh. So you're an artist that doesn't make art. What do you make? Music. Oh, I see. That's interesting. That's another interesting observation. Artists that don't make art and are actually uncomfortable with the concept of art. Because once you start to look at it, I can see why people are uncomfortable with it. First of all, it's ageless. Interesting. Permanence. Anonymity. It has intrinsic value. It's serious. Art for art's sake. It becomes philosophical. I think people see that as all very grown up. God, if I let anyone know that I'm actually deadly serious about what I'm doing, and actually I'd do it on a desert island if there's no one there, a couple of budgery guys and a chimpanzee, I'd still do it, you know. Um, for some reason, people don't think about that side, but it's in me. I'm riddled with this axis. Um, I, I take ideas from Picasso, and I also take ideas from Jesse J. Both are interesting. And, uh, you get loads of little... Is that a phone? Sorry, my head. No, it's alright. It's still got the work phone on. Just tune in, so keep an eye on those things. Um, but this axis, this axis deeply fascinates me. I don't have any profound answers to offer anyone, but contradictions are interesting. Juxtapositions are interesting. Trying things in different ways is interesting. And, um, oh, I'll go to this slide first. I've got the best slide. But, you know, Picasso versus Calvin Harris might be a very interesting lecture to give. You know, like whether anyone can follow me on that. Maybe some people might not know how Picasso was. <coughs> no, he's fair his entire life. There he is in his prime. Most people know him looking a bit like that, a bit wrinkly. He looks absolutely fantastic, by the way. Love the wrinkles. Go, Picasso. Calvin Harris, not so wrinkly. Um, you sort of wonder, will he still be there, you know? <laughs> Imagine. Um, but anyway. But this kind of, um, I think I've made my point, but um, when you just, when you get popular music, you're, you're kind of restricted by some very narrow ideas that unless you're able to think your way out of, they will destroy you. You know, those ideas about being a failure at 25 can have a serious impact on people. You know, I've witnessed it many times. And I bet some of you in this room have been through you know, if anyone's gone beyond 25, and how many people are older than 25? I'm not going to ask how old you are, you know, yeah. Anyone go through a bit of a, well, it's not a midlife, is it? What is it? It's an early adolescence crisis. I mean, did anyone go through that? I mean, once you're through it, it's amazing, you know. Who gives a job anymore? In fact, all I think about when I go on stage is just how brilliant I'm going to be. <laughs> I don't mean that, I'm going to go for being positive, but I mean, it's just, it's exciting. But I think these ceilings, are difficult because they do affect things like marketing strategies. Um, I'm always so aware of how much in a rush people are, you know? When MySpace first came out, I mean, how many people rushed to stick their tracks on it? I remember it was like watching lemmings running over the cliff. You know, it's like, stop! You know, don't give them everything. I mean, what, what are you going to, where's the anticipation gone? It's like running into a bar naked. Come and get me! It's like it's off putting. You know, come on, charm me. Tell me you've got something and don't let me hear it. You know what I mean? I don't know what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to do some press Let's go back to the other slide because it's a bit more technical. Um, so, the artist experiences two times of process these process. I call them an intrinsic process and an extrinsic process. They're very simple. The intrinsic, the emotional, the personal, the you. Songwriting, recording, production, performance, all that stuff that you can own. And I believe that this, I don't know if you're aware of this thing called inductive reasoning, um, but inductive reasoning is basically simple. It's that you make your decisions about what to do next based on the best of your knowledge of what's actually happening at the time. So it's a bottom-up, it's a bottom-up logic. I did this, it worked. Well, I think that's a pretty good reason to do this. It worked, I'll do this. Oh, it didn't work, I'll do this. You know, it's that sort of working it out as you go along. Um, and I think this is what we tend to think of as an authentic experience. And I think why we idolise the blues is that we know that they weren't businessmen. 
there's that sense that they were doing it for some sort of deeper reason, and that this whole thing, this wonderful thing, is what we want, you know. We just want to make decisions based on one call to the next, one thing to the next. But there's this other thing going on, these extrinsic forces that I think sociologists would say were very much the post-war era, when marketing people started to work out commercial behaviours and people would buy albums and you could sign artists and own their rights and all this sort of stuff. Um, commercial, environmental, marketing, promotional, selling, and it's deductive. It's, now, deductive reasoning is a top-down logic, so that's bottom-up. Top-down is that you make big sweeping generalisations. Anyone who want to be a pop musician, right, has to be selling 120,000 albums or some other generalisation, they've got a telly. And then instantly you look at the next, you look across at any artist who's achieved it and you take their marketing strategy and you just apply it. Now, major labels, when they got into serious trouble about 10 years ago, what started to not work was that they couldn't just use a template of what had worked because suddenly it didn't work. Do you remember that cataclysm when they thought they understood it, they thought they knew it, and it just bottomed out, you know? Because the good old internet, well, its first version wasn't that threatening, but I think Web 2 was like the most sinisterly terrifying thing ever to hit planet Earth. Suddenly there was interactivity. Suddenly artists climbed down from being God and just became that person next door that you know, with the Facebook chat. Remember? Hey, yeah. hey, that's a sort of dodge. You read you to read. <laughs> How you doing? That's an awkward one. How you doing? Uh, really like that track. Um, if you're around later, so really like to talk about track two on the like Suddenly, web two. Hey! No. Yeah! Let's get it together. You know. And it was like amazing. And artists stopped being these mythological creatures and started being just people. And it really threatened this because people then wanted to actually know about the emotional, personal, parts of the musician, and they thought uh, that that was the thing that no one was interested in. And when David Bowie, I was just talking about, uh, what, was your, what was your name? Uh, Neil. Neil, earlier on, is that Dave, David Bowie, his comeback, <coughs> knew that he couldn't come back as David Bowie, well, he was too old, wasn't he, to be dressed up in his <laughs> spider from Mars gal, you know, but and he looked kind of like over it. It's like he was over David Bowie. He was over it. He was just a songwriter. And something really poetic and quite beautiful, I thought, was coming through in that work. It's like he found himself as this guy making music, perhaps the person he always wanted to be, but he was caught up in the music industry when he was going through this mythological stage where everyone had to be untouchable, unreachable, and gone. Um, and I get the feeling he's kind of quite enjoying the uh, discourse that he has with his audience. And perhaps all the musicians from that era probably uh, envy the way people see it now. Obviously, there are downsides to this new era, you know, record sales. And Things like that. But slowly, new economies are growing where clever record labels are starting to work out it's still possible to make money out of selling this again. But the trouble is, there's a whole load of musicians with record on books still hurtling around on this. You know, this is not the time to be thinking about this, it's probably more time to be thinking about that. Because deeply ingrained in your personal views, your successes, your disasters, your chaos of your life, is going to be the most sexy marketing plan we've ever thought of. And yet all the time you're on chapter three telling you, marketing, get your tracks, master them, send them to this person, this person, and say, stop! What's that got to do? That's like a different time. That's my view. Um, that side. Oh, we don't need that one. Well, they're interesting, but I'm close to them. It's an interesting slide. But I think I was going to take it out. Let's have a look at the second <laughs> Well, no, no, actually, I think I'll throw it in. Um, if I have one last order, I'm very quick. Uh, I'm very, very interested in uh, input and output diagrams. I'm also philosophically interested in that thing called cause and effect or causality, where you can actually prove that this will definitely happen if you do this. A definitely leads to B, leads to C, etc. Um, and this is a very interesting diagram of uh, what goes in and what comes out. Um, most people know that the chicken eats corn. Yeah? Peck, peck, peck. Most people know that the chicken lays an egg. Anyone who doesn't? Don't mind. Um, they do, that's where they come from. <laughs> but not many people know what goes on in there. And they couldn't do a diagram to explain it. So there's the un great unknown. I think one of my sort of creative kind of thoughts is that <clears throat> now it's important to sort of understand your own chicken and egg 
scenario, really. So you know what you like goes in, don't you? You know what kind of comes out. But marketing is a way of accelerating the apps. All marketing is sort of the process of speeding this process up, trying to maximise it. But it's time now to kind of, if you are the chicken, you need to be a perfect chicken. So you can sort of, <coughs> oh, I see. <laughs> and actually then, um, sort of elevating and foregrounding some of the ideas. It's, it's a bit you know, but, and that's just the same thing. So uh, I'm now changing the chicken for the musician. Um, ideas go out, songs come out the other side. Um, but it's basically that emotional process of just raw data turning into songs. To a musician, it just seems like, yeah, write a song. But trust me, and I'm sure you know already, that when you talk to people that are not musicians, they just think that's amazing. What, you just kind of walk down the street, you know, and then when you get to the other industry, you can write a song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a genius. <laughs> you know, kind of realize, but there's things that you're doing called processing the world that a lot of other people are amazed about. But I don't think the artist spends enough time reflecting on some of those incredible processes. It works out how you make decisions, why you chose this over this, what, what was it about this song idea? And then, okay, get a bit closer to that feeling of what made you choose this chord over this one, and convert that into a sort of marketing thought process. Like, Okay, the next time you start thinking about marketing, I ask you, I urge you to think more like a musician and not suddenly to start thinking about chapter three in some book you read. Or what's her name? Annie, I can't remember her name. It's a very good book, but. Yeah. Okay. I want to get to the end because I want to ask the question. Um, oh, it is another. Um, pontifications, the old school and all that rock and hip hop there. If you don't know the blues, there's no problem guitar, playing rock and roll, or any other form of popular music, right? So that means if I teach someone a pentatonic scale and a blues chord progression, it will somehow lead to rubbish. Um, I think when people say real hip hop, they want it more buried in the streets, they want it more connected to the streets, and the grime and the roughness of the streets, they don't want the fluff. This idea that you're not getting it culturally from the bottom up, you can't be for real and all of that, so they're totally all the fake hip hop that came through the last 20 years it was based on people who had been brought up in quite nice homes, going to quite nice schools, trying to project the idea that they actually grew up sort of God knows what on the streets of New York. And you ended up with a kind of hypocrisy of authenticity. You know? It was the most inauthentic type of authenticity. Anyway, um, no, no. <laughs> Very near the end. Um, Stuart Lambert, um, who was my line manager at Westminster University uh, up until two years ago, is now officially the head of school there. But um, <clears throat> in a conversation this year uh, about talking about authenticity, he basically said that authenticity is a sham, commercial success is a, is a shimmer, I think that's how you pronounce it, or is it chimera? Or is that a car? Chimera, yeah, I never quite know. What does sham mean? mean? Sorry. Sorry? What does sham mean? Oh, a sham. Yeah. A falsehood okay. doesn't exist. That basically there never has been a definitive version of anything. There never has been. I mean, simply the idea is that thing here is that maybe if Adam and Eve had existed, you could say they were authentic, original human beings. But everything else is a hybrid from there and uh, whatever. So see copy. That. <laughs> Sorry. A copy. And interesting the reason I put Bob Dylan is that wonderful Martin Scorsese film where Bob Dylan completely counterintuitively agrees to let Martin Scorsese go through all the footage of Bob Dylan and allow a new reading of Bob Dylan to be foregrounded, which was that he was a fake. He came up with a name that wasn't his name. Yeah, did all the things that pop musicians do. Um, he lied about who he was in his early days. He pretended he was a famous musician when he wasn't. Um, and then when he got all the people believing he was authentic, he then played electric guitar and got called Judas, didn't he? He was always playing around with notions of authenticity, and he would always slip through it very intelligently. He was always one step ahead. And I think as he's got older, he's quite honest about he was opportunistic as the next person in some ways. He understood that people thrived on this notion of authenticity, and uh, he played a game with it in some ways. I don't mean he's not authentic, but I think he was objective in his understanding of what authenticity was. And uh, yeah, he definitely played with the media. And the chimera idea of the multi-headed um, sort of beast, the mythological beast, 
is that idea that well, success, if you try to define it as a single thing, you fail because there are so many different kinds of success and yeah, ultimately your own definition of success is the one you're going to have to live with anyway, so you have to try and work out what you think about it. Um, and I think if you do sort of think along those lines, it will then affect the way you develop strategies. Um, so my initial questions, and I'm not in any way going to hog it here, I mean, it might just be, uh, if you don't want to ask questions, more like a statement, um, that was a load of rubbish and I don't know any more about it. But if you do have any questions, here's where I start. Um, how has authenticity shaped popular music? Authenticity and genre, what are the differences? Obviously your own views on that, and possibly the genres that you feel you're in. Does commerciality compromise authenticity? Has the internet changed the way we perceive authenticity? What are the different media perceptions of authenticity? Are we seeing shifting attitudes towards authenticity? That might also be a web to debate. Um, and how do our strategic actions as musicians reflect our deeply held beliefs about authenticity and success? That's the most important question, ultimately, uh, from this talk. And that's it. I think, just check. Yeah. Thank you, Kristen. Well done. Thank you very much. If those questions don't interest you, um, we've got to get into this somehow, and I am interested to find out. Um, do, does anyone have any strongly held beliefs about keeping it real? Does anyone have a notion in their head that something is real and something is unreal? And would they dare to be open enough to talk about how that might? Would you better then talk about your own sort of marketing strategies or things like that, in ways in which you are making sure that your these values and beliefs are kept intact? Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't want to, but I find myself. I'm going to sit down and back. Um, I find myself, uh, even though I, 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 beforehand I thought I'm not one of those people that's like going to be stuck into you know this one mode of thinking based yeah. on the genre that I come yeah. from. But then, so okay, I'm kind of I guess I'm in the rock indie genre. And then, so sometimes I collaborate with people, and I wrote a song for a girl. That was a, a pop song. And I think one of my values for making music is to make music that touches people on and people connect with. And then what happens, I write a song that people really like and sing along to. And then part of me starts thinking, oh my god, it's a shit song, it's such a pop song, I've got much better music. So, like, it's funny how. So it's almost like a fear of your own success there. Yeah, I don't know. It's just like coaches. That's funny. It's funny because, like, I. Um, I didn't, you know, that uh, I'm still li trying to live up to to something, some idea of authenticity, yeah. even though I like all kinds of music, I like pop music, yeah. rock, and everything. And then when it actually happens, yeah. I take a step back. Yeah. And interestingly, when people do achieve um, standards or traditional notions of success, you kind of feel, um, well, I don't want to talk about anyone else's behalf, but I, through my own life, I felt immense jealousy of their ability to be at peace with the idea of being successful. But it's sort of like, and I can see just a little grain of hate built. Well, I've got that under control. I don't feel any hate. I love, I love people's success. I, I actually, I mean, working in education, I mean, Ed Sheeran was one of my students. And like, when he went off and um, became stratospherically successful and didn't talk to me anymore, I kind of thought, is this a time to hate him? <laughs> no, he's got a distinction. His coursework was excellent. This is a time to love him. And I, I, I didn't feel any hate at all. I'm very proud of him. But it, it does, yeah. Something does. Uh, I think we all recognise what you're saying, but there is an interesting, is it a paradox or it's a challenge anyway, an obstacle that our own thinking is potentially holding us back. I always got very envious of Damon Alden, the way he could shape shift. You know, he could be the indie kid, or he could be in Mali making a kind of world music album, which is in more recent times. And then he could come up with a conceptual project, like Gorillaz. I think this is amazing. Why have I built this notion that, I mean, another way of looking at authenticity is that you need to stay in the same band, bloody hell. No, come on. Come on. I think this is going nowhere. You know, bang me is to bring wall. You look at artists, 21st century artists, and they shift about. One beautiful thing about pop, by the way, is it's like a fashion industry. Every six months, off we go and work somewhere else. Great. And we think, no, no, no. That just shows that they're not for real. No, it doesn't. It just means they've evolved a little bit beyond your idea of what 
keeping it real is. It's creativity. You know, if you were just calling it creativity, chopping and changing production, changing your hairstyle, why not? But <clears throat> we have problems with it um, in this country quite a lot. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Uh, do you really think that, because you mentioned uh, keeping it real, and uh, you made in your question you made a connection to marketing strategies connected to how you keep it real. Yeah. Do you think there is a really kind of, because I think those ideas are really disjointed in a sense of art and the way we express uh, as an individual, the way we express art, art has nothing to do with the way we market it in, in its in the sense of, in its pragmatic sense of the art, which is our kind of uh, our kind of journey towards finding meaning to where we are now and meaning towards you know, the relationship between, yeah. the relationship between the world and ourselves yes. and there do you think there really is a connection there and my, actually I have a question for you do you think it's valid to class popular music as a as a genre of music or is it more as a status because really you've got bands like Pink Floyd which are one of some of the biggest bands of all time, but you wouldn't really class them as pop music, or like jazz people in the 50s, they were the pop Why wouldn't you class them as pop music? Because they they sold lots of numbers. If pop music is, it means it's popular, isn't it? So no, I don't think that is the right reading of the word pop music. I think the best reading, the most helpful reading, is not to look at the way the word looked popular is derived from pop, or pop is derived from it. Let's not do that. The best way to look at it is that pop is a process. And what it means is that you have the doors, windows open, quite literally, to allow other people, teams of people in to work on the music. If you sign to a major label as a pop act, you are basically signing away your rights necessary to write the songs. You will have lots of people coming in to talk to you about image and marketing. And a successful pop act signed to a major label, or a major label signing a pop star, will want to know that that musician can be a pop star, i.e. can share their creativity with other people and allow direction to come in that is based on marketing so demographics and this, this trend and that trend. You have to give away a certain amount of your own artistic voice to be a pop star. But what about people that, um, because you mentioned before a lot of, you know, about the pop stars and all those TV programs that you see them on yeah. after they've been to rehab or whatnot. <laughs> Don't you think there is people in popular music that are genuinely popular musicians and then there is the, amount of, the kind of people that are more like celebrities? So you've got people like, let's say, Rob Thomas, he's an yeah. example of Matchbox 20. He sold 80s as a songwriter, songs that he wrote yeah, himself. Yeah, he sold so. 88 million albums. Carlos Santana sold a lot, yet they're, they're going to walk down the street and you know some people will recognize him, but it's not going to be a buzz. Then you've got somebody like uh, the, what's his name? The, the something. I don't know, Vanilla Ice or whatever. But they're not pop stars in the sense. I think to be a star, you have to be twinkling visibly in front of others. I think the recognition thing doesn't undermine what a pop star is. I think it's part of what people want from pop musicians. They want them to be visible. Um, you know, they, I think that idea that if it was just about sales, and I agree there are lots of writers making lots of money, you know, work making pop music. But I think the pop star is the person at the front that's recognized. Not really. uh, I don't know. Doesn't doesn't that mean like uh, I think doesn't that mean that let's say for Rob Thomas is who is actually a very successful yeah. frontman. You know, he's been using the. Oh sure. <coughs> doesn't that mean that down the street that like, wouldn't be? Well. Yeah, because the thing is, it's not about <coughs> you kind of getting for his music, and it's not. Yeah. And so for the essence of his being as an artist, that's what you're appreciating for. Yeah. So it's, it wouldn't be the case of. Kind of, it doesn't change the fact that there is about a hundred million people on this planet that they listen to. So, do you think that's got the same effect? They haven't seen one to tell you, let's say, but they've listened to it and they've felt something in the songs. So, what's, what's the sharp end of your question? What are you really asking me? I don't. I, well, I, 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 in terms of kind of the yeah, straight away, but, but in terms of the, my question was whether we could ask whether your view on that because I, I, I don't, in my head, I can't understand see popular music as a genre, and also how is it is strategy and marketing connected with authenticity uh, in terms of the art form that you, you kind of deliver? I think that, um, m yeah, oh, do you want to ask that question? Yeah, I think pop music, like, you know, like you said, how you bring some writers and marketing people and uh, all those people together to create, like, one act. I think it's, 
I don't even under, like I don't understand why musicians and you know artists who consider themselves as authentic or whatever you know original. I don't even I don't understand why they compare themselves to pop stars because that's a completely different thing. It's entertainment and people who perform pop music like you know whatever Britney Spears like she's an entertainer and that's a completely different talent. But there is, when you say that there is a lot of successful artists who are amazing performance as well, but I think it's just different. Yes, but it's a completely different thing. I think that... You're trying to say success discussion. makes them pop. Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. It's just uh, to, in my head... Uh, you've, got, you've got to take the, the, uh, the word pop has changed. What you're saying is like, if you were someone like Led Zeppelin or Heavy Metal, are they were pop. Yeah, because they're not no more, it's changed. It changes with the time. Things change. What is she saying is they're more entertainment, which is what they are now. Some of them are cookie plasters. The other well, thing you're is saying, about music and songs. You're saying if you sell so much, you'll pop. But it's, it's not. It's pop is change as a, as a genre in a way. Yeah, but that's look what I said it in my head. I've, I, I, I always, I've always kind of perceived it as numbers because the truth is, if Led Zeppelin were alive no. today, they would outsell most of the people. Like, yeah, but they, they that's not how uh, pop is, like I said, pop's different. Depending on how you take it. I think that's yeah. a really good point. I think um, I totally accept that point about entertainment. And I think I put it on my slide um, what pop musicians were, but it's about entertainment. Um, it's interesting that um, the, the word entertainment comes up in a context there where my doctor was into a but there's a sense that entertainment is uh, not quite as serious as something else. But I think to be authenticity um, is, in the, um, is in the honesty of the transaction. So if your business is about entertainment, then there's the, uh, there's the authenticity. The inauthenticity would be to, for the, to pretend or to, to, you know, the inauthenticity thing would be to someone to stick to a rock approach because they believe that somehow the genre itself is imbued with authenticity. I think in the modern world, because we can get to know our artists so much better, authenticity is in finding out the artist, whatever kind of music they make, means it, that they're doing what they believe. And I think what the, the days that I think are over are where you can just take off the shelf a particular identity that have, carries with it a whole set of marketing strategies. I think we're going to see a lot more topsy-turvy <coughs> things, a lot more pop stars behaving like... I mean, I was, I was quite shocked in a way when Kings of Leon came out as a boy band in the sense that their songs had been written for them and um, they, they were put together as an idea in a boardroom, essentially. I mean, I was quite shocked by that, you know. Yeah, well, they were put together. I mean, they were they were d d delivered. You know. They're, They're like brothers. brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the idea of how we're going to be received coming out with beards first, the idea that we think Lynn and Skinner, or we think some kind of authentic Deep South concept. They weren't very big in America at that time. They broke in the UK before they broke over here. We were much more likely to buy that wholesale than the Americans were, which the Americans were still really look. And they weren't going to buy it, but they came over here and we cross-referenced it with a whole lot of ideas about men with beards. As soon as they made it, the beards came on, and suddenly they like, take that, circa 93, and they were like, oh, they're pretty, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> and some people abandoned them, but their audience expanded massively. And you saw the strategy, it was the Trojan's horse strategy, break in by being believed as one thing, and then break out, coming up with something else. So, That's the what the police yeah, so, police, absolutely. Yeah, many, many strategies have been like that. I mean, the whole major label idea of releasing, signing a lack to a major label, and then releasing on indie labels for a few years to build up this notion of authenticity and then blasting it into the big one, you know. Um, it's a real problem, this authenticity idea. I think people have got some very <laughs> warped ideas. I, I, I think your point, though, just to be able to expand on that, you said. <coughs> what, what, about success? Yeah. Yeah, it just seemed to me what you were saying was basically you were equ equating success with it being pop. Whereas what you said about entertainment and, uh, and also Britney Spears. Here said as well, I think so the, the old idea of, uh, I mean, Britney Spears was preceded by Madonna, who was doing exactly the same thing. But she was authentic because she wasn't saying, oh, I'm writing the songs. That's brilliant. That is, I wish I'd said that. You know, <laughs> I wish I had. That's a brilliant thing to say. Madonna is a fantastic example of someone right from the beginning of her career and almost at the present as able to kick the ball one step ahead of everyone when it comes to authenticity. She's proved that you can be a very successful pop star and own it and, you know, really have control and get deep respect 
you know, and in that middle third of her career, she had all those fantastic French DJs wanting to work with her. You know, she moved to London and was happy with all the hipsters. There was no, there was no problem with it. I mean, Blondie before her had done something similar. Now Blondie does all tomorrow's parties and all those kind of cool things. And yet at the time, what was that? You know, do you know what I mean? It's a strange thing when some artists manage to, to sort it out. They seem to have some kind of way of twisting up ideas about how we develop concepts of authenticity. They refuse to allow it to be owned by the boring people. There's no reason why entertainment can't be authentic. That, but that wasn't what you were saying, was it? You weren't saying it couldn't be. You were just observing yeah. it. I mean, my view of authenticity is that, you know, when somebody is concerned about being authentic or claiming to be 